Roswell Flight Test Crew, here today to take a look at the Typhoon H from Unique. To keep up with the latest on drones, click subscribe now before you forget or change your mind. Let's find out what's inside. Well, on top we've got a few accessories. Let's just set these aside for a moment. And here we have it. The Typhoon H. It feels sturdier than the Q500, which has a lot of flex in the airframe. Now, after you fold the limbs up into position, they feel extremely solid. To fold them back down, you just press on this button here. The landing struts feel so sturdy, I actually forgot for a moment that they're retracts. The limbs and the struts are carbon fiber, and they feel extremely rigid. The body of the aircraft is made out of plastic. It feels lightweight, but certainly strong enough to do the job. Up front, we've got the ultrasonic collision avoidance system. Not to be confused with the upcoming optical collision avoidance system using Intel's RealSense technology. We've got lights at the end of each limb for pilot orientation, as well as a USB port here for connecting to a computer. Notice that there is no optical flow sensor, like you see on the Autel X-Star or the DJI Phantom 4. So it looks like Unique is relying entirely on GPS for position hold. The gimbal comes with this plastic bracket to keep it from flopping around during shipping. Be sure you remove it before powering up the aircraft or the gimbal motors could be damaged. This gimbal bracket is a big improvement over the one that shipped with the Q500. And here we have the gimbal itself. It's a 4K camera with 3-axis stabilization. It looks very similar to previous models, but I understand it's been upgraded to provide better image quality. On the bottom of the gimbal, we have another USB port, as well as a slot for a micro SD card. If you push up on this plastic tab, you can remove it from the aircraft by sliding forward. Let's see what else we've got inside the box. This is the ST16 controller with this monitor located between the sticks for telemetry and video. Now I've grown up with a conventional radio design so I have to be honest this feels a little awkward in my hands. It's going to be interesting to see what it's like to fly with. It's plenty sturdy though and not too heavy so it should be comfortable to hold while you're flying. Now obviously there is a ton of functionality on this radio. Just look at all these knobs and switches. Use this red button to start and stop the motors. Over here, we've got a switch to raise and lower the landing struts. On the back of the radio, you've got a slider switch to set the tilt angle of the camera. You've also got the tortoise hair slider, which determines how responsive the aircraft is to your input. Across the bottom, you've got a USB port, a slot for a micro SD card, and a headphone jack. Above the left stick, you will find two switches and a knob. The left switch sets the tilt mode. Whether the slider on the back controls the position of the camera directly or the speed at which it tilts up and down. We've also got the pan mode switch. In the top position, it works like the Q500 or the DJI Phantom. The camera takes its facing from the aircraft itself, using the gimbal to smooth out any jerky movements. In the middle position, the gimbal still turns with the aircraft but now you can use this knob to make adjustments left or right to the angle of the camera. Finally, when the switch is in the bottom position, the camera facing is completely decoupled from aircraft facing. It will look in whatever direction you set for it, regardless of which way the aircraft moves. Way over here on the other side, we've got an auxiliary button that doesn't do anything yet, and a switch that enables the ultrasonic sensors. They will help you avoid obstacles but be aware that this also limits the top speed of the aircraft. Finally, we have the flight mode switch. The top position is smart mode, which closely resembles what DJI calls intelligent orientation control. All inputs on the right stick are relative to your position. Push out, the aircraft moves away from you. Pull back, it moves towards you, regardless of which direction it's facing. It also establishes a safety bubble around you so the aircraft won't come any closer to you than about 25 feet. Further, it enables follow me, so if you start walking with the radio in smart mode, 
the aircraft's just going to follow you around. So here's the buttons that allow you to capture stills, video, and here's the power switch. Let's see what else we've got. It's a cartridge style battery, 5400 milliamps, four cells, a DC power converter, a DC adapter, a sunshade for the screen, a battery charger, with a USB port for charging the radio. Inside this black piece of styrofoam which covers the aircraft, we found this little box hiding. Let's find out what's inside. A 16 gigabyte U1 micro SD card and an A to micro B USB cable. On the micro SD card, you'll find a complete copy of the aircraft manual in PDF format. So make sure you don't accidentally erase that before you start filming. And we've also got an envelope which contains some documents. A quick start guide, package inventory, know before you fly card, critical for new pilots, a card telling you not to take the aircraft back to your local retailer if something is missing or damaged, two cards telling you how you can use the unique wizard to control the camera independently from the aircraft. And here we have a cheat sheet telling you what all the different blinking lights mean. I'd suggest getting it laminated and keeping it with you in the field. Finally, let's see what's inside those two black bags we set aside earlier. This one contains props, 10 in all, so one complete set and four spares. And in this one, we've got an AC power cord and an X-strap. Let's get the batteries charging. Plug in the charger and then insert the battery. Because of how it's shaped, it only fits in one way. LEDs indicate the charge status. Two things to be aware of. One, you have to push down harder than you might think to make the battery seat correctly. And two, when the charge cycle is complete, the charger emits a loud, smoke detector-like beep. Plug in the USB cable to the side of the charger and connect it to the controller to get that charging. Always remember to treat your charger as if it could explode into flames at any second, because it could. Now, we'll go ahead and mount the propellers. You'll want to do this outside, but I'm showing it here as a demonstration. Notice that the alternative motors have black and white tips. These correspond to markings on the propellers to tell you which ones go where. If you look closely, the top propeller has got a white ring around the inside, and the lower one is just black. To attach, line up the grooves and push straight down, then turn in the direction of the lock icon. The hub at the center of the motor will pop up, and you should hear it click into position. To remove the propellers, push down on the hub and rotate in the unlock position. Let's power up the system and see how it works. Always turn on the controller first. Let it go through its boot-up sequence, which should take about 30 seconds. Insert a battery into the aircraft, and then press and hold the power button. You'll also notice that the aircraft beeps periodically to remind you it's powered up. Looking at the aircraft itself, the first thing we notice are the orientation lights. White forward, red to the back, blue to the left, and green to the right. Also, you've got a status indicator to the back. Taking a look at the controller, we can see the view from the camera gimbal displayed in the center of the screen. Now there's some latency in the video signal, but it appears to be an improvement over the Typhoon Q500. All around the live video, we have flight instruments and controls. Across the top, we have the current time, the number of GPS satellites the controller is receiving, a signal strength indicator for the video, and the controller's battery charge. Down the right side of the screen, we have an aircraft status indicator, obstacle avoidance system indicator, compass and GPS calibration, and controls for autonomous maneuvers and camera tasking. In the corner of the screen, this gear icon allows you to make adjustments to the camera settings. On the left, we have aircraft telemetry, battery charge, GPS status and the number of satellites in view, its latitude and longitude position, altitude, ground speed, 
and the distance from the controller. Because we're indoors, we're getting poor GPS reception, and that's giving us some strange indications right now. To the right of the telemetry, we have the camera controls. And then across the bottom, we have some additional system tools. The pad button gives you access to the Android operating system. And the system settings allows you to bind the aircraft and make changes to how the controller and the aircraft behave. If you change the controller to advanced mode, which is under system settings, the channel settings button allows you to make finer adjustments to the controller. If you have different aircraft bound to this controller, you can choose which one is active using the model select button. Right now, there's only one model I'm interested in flying, so let's take it out in the field and see how it performs. So the first thing we do before flight is a compass calibration. Now you want to make sure you get rid of any metal objects in your person, stay away from cars and fences and anything ferrous. You should do a compass calibration if the aircraft is brand new, if you haven't flown for a while, or if you move a significant amount of distance. Let's say you fly across the country, recalibrate. So to start compass calibration, have the radio and aircraft powered on, and then click on, on the right hand side, GPS calibration, then tap on compass. Now there's no visual indication on the radio that you're actually calibrating the compass. You will hear a little noise from the aircraft. And the lights on the aircraft start blinking. So start with the aircraft level. And when lights start flashing, have the green on the right hand side and tip it away from you. And when lights stop blinking on this pair of limbs, turn it anti-clockwise. Put the red on the right hand side and flip it over again. And repeat procedure with every pair of limbs. So Again, rotate, and over again. There's one time for that one. Rotate. And then again. Rotate. Okay. And one last set of limbs. That was a happy noise. We're calibrated. So let's see how it flies. So first thing I've got to mention is this is zippy. This is a lot faster than the previous Typhoon series. Quite a bit faster. And that's that's actually quite welcome. It's it's you could get some really dynamic camera shots with this thing. That's nice. Turns nice, flies nice, it's fast. You know, it's it's unique. Very smooth in the controls also. Seems to have a bit of expo by default. So it has very nice movement for a lot of stick moving. You have a very little input in the aircraft until you hit the stops. Then it goes really fast. So I think we got a bit of expo on here. Probably check the controls for that. Yaw authority is eh, reasonable. It's not tremendous, but it's smooth though. It doesn't gain or lose altitude while doing yaw. It does do a nice combination so you can do yaw forward and go right and it's just following just great. So the retracts, you just click switch up. And of course back down. <laughs> and the thing about the retracts, they don't affect the flight performance, so you can leave them down if you want to. So like other Typhoon class aircraft, this one has the ability to go from tortoise and hare. Basically fast response, slow response, or anywhere in between. Here's a split screen of how it reacts with full throttle takeoff and lateral movements. One neat thing we observed in doing the tortoise and hare comparison is that descent is affected by the tortoise mode. You go to tortoise, nice, slow, smooth descent. It's really quite nice. So like other Typhoon aircrafts, you can disable the GPS. So it's really easy to just click calibrate the GPS and click off. That's it. Let's see how it handles. So I'm flying in manual mode right now with no GPS. Actually, it's auto leveling still, but it's kind of old school. It floats with the wind and you have to stop it from going forward because you let go of the sticks, it just kind of keeps gliding in the direction you were going in. So yeah, something to be uh, aware of. Although it's a lot faster. The aircraft just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. And I've got a lot more speed with GPS off. There's no regulations as far as how fast it'll go then. Not, not keeping it from going too fast. Also, I had to add a bit of throttle because it was descending as it was accelerating probably beyond its normal threshold. So something to keep in mind. Though, 
not for beginners. If you're a beginner, do not play with this mode unless you are prepared to lose your aircraft or if you have a lot of practice for us. But it is definitely a, a different animal without the GPS on. So you might be asking yourself, why would someone play without GPS? Well, two reasons I think. One, you can go a little faster. And two, if you're in an environment where there might be something around you interfering with the GPS, like a building, then it might not fly properly with the GPS on. So turn it off, go fly, be safe. Next we have our gimbal test. So what we're doing now is playing a little bit with the gimbal. Now this, unlike some other aircraft, can spin around and around and around and around. We'll get the idea, no stop. It's got a slip ring in there, which keeps it from binding up, which is pretty cool, actually. So here's a little demo. So finally, back in the lab, I told you I was curious to see what it was going to be like to fly with this extra wide radio. So I'm going to give that a shot, and I figure this will also give you an opportunity to see some footage straight off the aircraft. Let's take it up and see what we get. Alright, I have to confess, this radio does feel a little strange in the hands, but once you're engaged and actively flying the aircraft, you totally forget about it. It isn't something which actually impacts your experience of it. And as you can see, it's capturing some very nice footage here. Seems nice and smooth. Of course, you guys know I love making low passes on things. <laughs> so now we're gonna do a persistence test. We're gonna time the aircraft in the air. It's a fully charged, brand new battery. It's about 90 degrees outside right now. So when the battery gets low, we're just gonna land the aircraft when it says to. So now we're going to test the front end collision avoidance. It does not have the Intel real sense, so it can't see, but it does have ultrasonics for distance measurement. So we're gonna aim at the wall and see if it hits it. The effect of turning on obstacle avoidance is it slows down the controls a bit, enables the ultrasonics, and little lights in the front will flash, you know it's on. Now it's not recommended to take off and land with that on, but it's great because what happens when you can approach an object, it slows down. It essentially takes your forward stick and just ignores it completely and holds the aircraft in place until you back up away from the obstacle or it moves. So that was our look at the unique Typhoon H. Go ahead and tell us what you think in the comments below and click subscribe to keep up with the latest on drones. Well, hope you're watching. See you next time. All right, fly safe. Taking a look at the controller, we can see the view... Keep being upstage, it's like a pet. It feels sturdier than the... Started, started it again. Stop, don't touch it. Why can't I touch it? It's my toy. <laughs> okay. Here it is, the Typhoon H. Don't, don't pick it up. Okay, Just sorry. Stop, stop molesting it. <laughs> it's so beautiful.